Once upon a time, Lagos was just an island inhabited by Yoruba fishermen and hunters. Fast forward centuries later, with the arrival of Portuguese explorers in 1472, began a trade of an international nature. Then came the British in 1851, who not only bombarded Lagos, but locked the door behind them and kept the keys in their pocket. Lagos was annexed and declared a colony by the British colonial masters in 1862. It gets interesting, but that will be a history lesson for another day. The silver lining, however, was the independence that came afterwards. Along came the creation of Lagos State on May 27, 1967. Lagos is a derivative of Portuguese imposition of Lagos de Curamo on account of its wetland topography and network of lagoons. The word Lagos means lakes in Portuguese. Before the adoption of the name by the indigenes, the area was initially known as Oko, meaning farm. Later, the Kingdom of Benin dubbed the local settlement Eko, which means camp. The Portuguese would later refer to it as Onim before settling for the name Lagos, which has come to stay. Each name represents a layer in the city's rich and cosmopolitan past. From pre-colonial to colonial and post-colonial times, Lagos has witnessed development that distinguishes the state from other states and regions. Despite its Yoruba origin, Lagos has become home to many and remains a confluence for people of diverse cultures, orientations and lineages. The high rate of migration of people to Lagos State is attributed to its sound economic base, strategic maritime location and socio-political relevance even after it was stripped of federal capital territory status. The state has also enjoyed good administration dating back to its creation in 1967, with Brigadier Mobalaji Johnson becoming the first military administrator. Fast forward many years later, Lagos has seen the likes of Mike Aigwe, Buba Marwa, Bola Ahmed Tinubu and other leaders shaping the state with policies and a heavy dose of political will. Our attention on the program rests on one of the administrators whose dedication to service has not only earned him national attention, but he has also gained international recognition by virtue of his stewardship. Born 28th of June 1963 in Lagos, Baba Tude Raji Fashola is a law student of the University of Benin. He graduated in 1987 and was called to the Nigerian Bar in November 1988. Fashola's career as a barrister started shortly after. He cut his teeth as a litigator and practiced private law for 14 years and was conferred with Nigeria's highest legal distinction, SAN, in 2004. His career path took a turn when he became very active in public service, which has now spanned over two decades. In the course of rendering service to nation, Babatunde Fashola served as Chief of Staff to Bola Ahmed Tinubu, the then Governor of Lagos State, from 2003 to 2007. He was also a two-term Governor of the State. And in 2015, President Buhari appointed him as the Federal Minister of Power, Works and Housing. His appointment was renewed in 2019 with an adjustment to his portfolio as work and housing for another four years. Babatunde Fashola is a recipient of several local and international awards. Fashola is patron Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, member Nigeria Bar Association, member International Bar Association, fellow of the Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria and notary public of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. He is married to Abimbola Fashola and the union is blessed with children. Join us as we have this conversation with history with Baba Today Raji Fashola. Thank you so much for having us in your office. This is Conversation with History and the whole idea is to chronicle your achievements. Uh, you have been a two-time governor of Lagos State two-time minister, and only God knows what's next. And if we would have to ask, what is next for you after this uh, portfolio you've held serving the country? Well, I think what is next is to stand back and introspect and uh, see perhaps uh, in my own self-challenging way how differently I could have done it, uh, and what mistakes, if any, I made. But you don't see your mistakes when you're running. So it's when you pause, you catch your breath, you can actually see, oh, okay, it could have been better then. So I think that's what's next. Mm. 
there's no how you would say your administration has been perfect which will readily come to mind what are those last minute things you wish you had enough time to do before leaving the office because you're just a few days away from using the okay, door so i don't do last minute things i try to avoid them usually they're error prone they are indicative of a lack of preparation and planning uh, where in May, I actually started writing my hand in over notes in September of 2022. So I just like to prepare, I like to plan, and I like to envision the next day, knowing of course that you don't own that day. It's grace that brings that next day forward. So of course, there, there are a few things that have come up in the last minute, things that uh, when I was writing my uh, handing over notes in 2022 September, uh, I didn't see that we will get 1.9 trillion funding for roads from NMPC under the tax credit scheme. But this is the result of a policy that the president initiated in 2019, now taking full traction in the twilight of his term. And that was opportunity to get going again. Uh, we had a plan for the roads to fund them, but it's now which road gets what, and going through the procurement process. So all of those things, uh, getting FEC approval, getting all the agreements in place, meeting with all the contractors. So what it gives then is that at least if you can't finish the road, you have built a sustainable funding plan in place and the next team should continue from where you stopped, not from where you started. So those are the kind of things that are coming through in the last minute. So when people even say, oh, why are we doing this in the twilight of our administration? They probably don't realize that the procurement process started much earlier. There are dozens of memos still waiting and they just have to flow into the la next administration. There are those things that are stated in the last minute that we could push through. But there's a point where, you know, this is public service, work never ends. This last four years, what would you say are your landmark achievements? This is not somebody saying, oh, you, you can nod your head like the Agama lizard, but this is you saying, well, I set out to do this, I set out to do this, this is what I've achieved, and I'm very proud of what I've achieved. What are the few ones you can easily highlight? Well, you see, I think that the public and I say this with a lot of deference, wants to see concrete and mortar and all of that. But I, I dwell on measuring other things because I know that those things are not an end in themselves. They are a means to a bigger end. So when we're building infrastructure, roads, bridges, uh, railways by the Ministry of Transport, uh, laying out a fiber optic cable through collaboration with the Ministry of Communication uh, and Digital Economy, or collaborating with those who are laying gas pipelines across our road network, we're actually building Nigeria's future, Nigeria's prosperity. So when I look back, the stock of infrastructure to GDP was about 20% when this administration came in. It's now 40%. So all of what we had before was 20% of GDP. In eight years, we doubled it. And it's still not enough. So when I look at that, I feel proud to have been a part of that team. Because I know the results and the benefits will be far, much, more, much further ahead. But during that period, the people I've interacted with, the workers, the artisans, the uh, people asphalting our roads, the food vendors, the suppliers, uh, painters, people roofing houses. Those were the real people about who those projects really were initiated. But people don't see them. I saw them. I have data of many of them in terms of the numbers we impacted, how many small businesses got to supply uh sand roofing sheets paint uh cables uh asphalt and all of that because that's what really infrastructure is about is driving the economy
creating jobs, creating livelihoods for families. So for me, that, that, was, that was a big, big thrill. Okay, which of the projects? Like I projects? Asked, uh, yes. Look, listen. That touches your heart the most. Maybe because I've stayed too long on the job. So I have no emotional attachment, attachment to any of those projects. Because for me, they are just the final product of a process. That process was integrating with people. So if you ask me which project, it was the people project. Mm -hmm. That was the key. This is your second term. The first tenure, you had uh, three portfolios, which of course included uh, power. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, it was reduced to just work and housing. Yeah. Was it that, did you think you were overwhelmed by those three portfolios? Well, I think that it was quite challenging and but certainly not overwhelming. And I think that people need to step back and look at what was left of the power ministry when I took it over. This was a ministry that used to have over 50,000 staff. This ministry owned, I think, 23 or 25 generating companies, including Kaindi, Shiruru, Jeba, Egbi, uh, Saple, our farm and so on and all of what are now the discos used to belong to that same ministry but by the time i took office all of these assets had been sold so the power and the control that ministers of power before me had had been taken away by a very very well intended privatization process it was exciting it was challenging because it was a big issue on the Nigerian developmental uh, uh, sheet, but I, I didn't feel overworked. It was quite challenging, and I love challenges anyway. Didn't you feel deflated uh, that, uh, I mean, this is you having three, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they said, come, count it to two, let's give him two. What do you think was behind that decision? Didn't you feel deflated that maybe the confidence reposed on you was just not, uh, it wasn't far reaching? Well, uh, there, there are many, many views to that. Of course, I would be lying if I didn't tell you that I reflected on what, what could have happened. There are things that I, I think that uh, I will talk about uh, after much reflection. But the point to make, as I said to you, there is no personal attachment to any of these things. It's a public trust as far as I'm concerned. The privilege to serve is momentous. I, I, I value it very, very seriously. And every time that opportunity comes, I give it my best shot. I run my marathon like a sprint. I leave nothing behind. I give everything to it. And after that, I just walk away knowing that I'm giving it my best. Sometimes it's good enough. Sometimes it falls short. And so that's life. You move on. In any event, you serve at the pleasure of the president. So the president didn't consult me when he was putting the ministries together. They asked for my opinion. So why should I question his decision if he felt? And look, listen, there's so many Nigerians who also want the opportunity. So it could have been any reason. He didn't give me a reason and I didn't ask him. Uh, so it could have been he wanted to bring more people in. It could have been he was dissatisfied with my performance. So many reasons, but I move on. <laughs> and if he had said, look, go home, I'm done. You don't even have one. I move on too. Were you satisfied with your own performance? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, that's why I recall some of the things we did. And uh, I know that uh, measuring back then, people, the feedback, because everything I do, I try to survey its impact on people. So having those surveys and people were saying, OK, it was getting predictable. It was getting steady, which was my short term objective. And there was a long term objective in the in the roadmap that we issued at the time that we were going to go from incremental to steady power and to uninterrupted power. I was not going to come and promise anybody any specific thousands of megawatts. Even if it's one unit, one joule of energy, my responsibility and my plan was how do we share it in a way that you can plan your life. Let's um, take you on, on um, what you said earlier when you said come you only retrospect after you've left office mm. now in the case of power i mean it's been four years and it was seen we still haven't gotten it right power wise well, and now looking at it from the big picture and being away from it 
as you have mm -hmm. been. Mm -hmm. What would you say? I mean, if you're talking to the ordinary Nigerian now, not the intellectuals, mm -hmm. I mean, how would you encapsulate the problem of power here in Nigeria? Well, um, I've told myself that I will respect the territory of my colleagues uh, and the present Minister of Power actually used to be a Minister of State with me in this ministry. And I think it is professional to do that. But what I do know, what I do know, and people may disagree, is that the way we have understood power is different from the way it actually exists in other jurisdictions. So we've understood power only in terms of uh, what is on the grid. And, you know, I ask people, um, and this was a debate I had also in our ministerial retreat, and I said, we're under reporting the power we generate. And people said, what are you talking about? I said, look, I'm not a scientist and I'm not an engineer. But I do realize and I understand that the smallest unit of energy is one joule. And that unit of energy owes no affiliation to the source that produces it. Whether it is produced by hydro, whether it is produced by coal, whether it is produced by diesel or by gas. It's just energy. So let us see. We cannot be reporting a GDP of so many billions of dollars and still be telling ourselves that we are generating only 4,000 megawatts of electricity. That doesn't make sense. Otherwise, it would be the eighth wonder of the world that we're performing. And in my exposure in that industry, one of the things I've seen is that almost every power production is a generator. So we must account, as we report that GDP, we must account for every unit of electricity that produces it, whether it's privately generated or publicly generated. And when we talk about countries that have so much energy, all of the energy is not on the grid. There are also off-grid mini-grids that is recorded as the totality of energy produced. So these are conversations that I'm developing into a book. Hopefully it will help the next team sit back and say, hey, maybe there was a misdiagnosis here. Did you confront corruption and did corruption oh. fight back? Oh, okay. You see, again, I don't, I don't, I see that we learn in sound bites. So when somebody like our president says, okay, we're confronting corruption and corruption fights back, and we own that as, a, as a corruption fights back everywhere in the world because when it becomes organized. So, yes, we saw instances of people either abusing their office. I got petitions from all over the country. One of your officers has done this. I'm not there. So I must use the system to say, go and investigate this and give me a report. Sometimes also, what is, what is reported as corruption turns out not to be so. Hmm. Sometimes, in some cases, there has been abuse of office and I say, escalate it to the head of service. Because for what people might not know, I once told some young people uh, during the NSAS protest, I was engaging with them, that look, the president has said, okay, I hear you. Let's talk about these things. I said, no, you should have sacked. I said, the president can't sack a public servant, a civil servant, a civil servant. His driver, if his driver is a civil servant, he can't sack him. And they were, they were surprised. Say, he's not his employee. He's an employee of the Civil Service Commission. The president can only say, this person has done this. I don't want him to work for me again. Deploy him. Then the civil service system deals with it. In the same way, the president can't sack a policeman. It's an employee of the Police Service Commission. So in that same way, I don't have the powers to sack a civil servant here. So I must move him to the administrative system that can deal with issues concerning them. So this is how we, we have moved on. But also, I mean, I'm not oblivious of the fact that the way we keep records, these files, provide a fertile ground for those who are so minded to alter things. So one of the things I've invested my time in here is to digitize all the records of this ministry. So you can then have digital files with digital footprints and metadata, but that even itself 
doesn't mean that a very skilled person can still not alter data, but it's a movement away from this. Um, the one we have completed is the land section, all the uh, federal land registry under our ministry. We fully digitized the entire registry now. We've scanned 53,000 or so, 53,000 files. That's over 2.4 million pages of records now fully digitized. Again, those are things that you do in order to be able to have uh, tracking and all of that. Okay. So you just talked about documentation as a way of fighting corruption. Yeah. What you document is very, I mean, it's there for every, anyone who yes. wants to look in the books. To Press, look at it. transparency, yes. and so, accountability. But, yes. So, but there are two factions to it. We have a systematic one and we have personalized corruption. And I'm asking this question against the saying, because you are quoted as saying, may your loyalty not be tested. Mm -hmm. So looking at that in that perspective um, would you say you have bent the rules at some point because of um, you know the personalities are involved well i'm struggling i i would ask you to be direct in your question because i can't no, imagine I want to generalize. I, 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 the question about loyalty um i think that people didn't understand me and uh you know I like to keep my gunpowder dry on the matter because one day I hope I will be able to write about it. But uh, when somebody was asking me, oh, uh, would you be loyal? I think that was a question that came up. Would you be loyal to so, so, so? And I told him that, well, I've seen people pledge loyalties. I don't pledge loyalties. And that is the context because you don't know how that loyalty will actually be tested. Mm -hmm. So I'm loyal to you. You are my sister or you are my brother. Will I take a bullet for you? You may. You may decide. Yeah, so don't even pledge it. Do it when it comes. Because you don't know how it will come. And that was the context in which I was speaking. Because I've seen people, you know, this is a very, very humbling story of life for me. Uh, People who had a parent, okay, a parent who needed medical help. First, they struggled to get the financial means. Having now got the financial means, it was who of the children would donate a kidney to save their mother. And they fought to the bitterest end. No, she's your mother. No, she's your mother. And that was a test of their loyalty. But they loved their mother. I saw that at first hand as governor. And of course, I go back to say, hey, what was happening here? That was their loyalty call. They failed to the mother that gave them life. It was something I reflected on. And I've looked back again, all of the stories of loyalty. And what you see really is that life is a story of betrayals. But it's a subject for another day. Well, that's very deep. <laughs> that's really very deep because mm. now you're looking at loyalty and integrity. So if you have to choose between no, loyalty I mean, and know, integrity. One, one governor, when he was telling me the story of his ordeal, left me with a memorable quote. He said, man is a mystery until he reveals himself. And I will never forget that. Have you had cause to reveal yourself? <laughs> I think I have revealed all of myself, or almost all of it. Okay. <laughs> we'll, leave <it. laughs> we'll leave it at that. Now, um, before, we move, before we move the goalposts, these um, low-cost housing schemes um, that you talk about, are they really for federal government staff, or is it just open to all? Because, I mean, these are questions that have been asked, okay. and uh, we need to have clarity. So, first of all, again, we need to have definition. I have never, and I say this touch wood, because I think I've been careful enough with how I express myself. I don't recall me ever offering anybody low-cost housing. I've always spoken to the principle of affordable housing. 
when you talk about affordable, affordable to who? Wait a minute. So, so let's just, let's just, affordability is a function of many factors, including how you pay. Okay? And then including what you earn and including what you want to buy. So I tell people also that you can't, I can't imagine a fresh graduate wanting to buy a house in Mitama or in Asukuru. Because in most parts of the civilized world, your road to housing is called a housing ladder. You enter either by living in the suburbs, as a young graduate, you commute. As you go higher in your career or in your business, you earn more money, you move. So again, back to definition about low cost. I didn't use low cost, but it doesn't matter. The global principle, I, I tell you about principle. The global principle by every government is to deliver affordable housing. Every government in the world. Every society indeed, because it's not government alone. Now, there are terms that have been used. And at our last meeting on Shelter Africa, this was also a point I addressed during, during um, the, plenary, the panel sessions. Somebody was talking of social housing. Somebody was talking about mass housing. So I asked them, are you using these terms interchangeably? They don't mean the same thing. Social housing is housing built for rent. In the international definition, mass housing derives is, and it's not the same thing as social housing, because the origin and etymology of mass housing is a housing project enunciated for Massachusetts states. But because of the mass in the SS, they started a brand. People have taken it for Adopted houses for, ma for the mass of people. Mm. They mean different things. So the global standard is affordable housing. And that is a combination of pricing. It's a combination of fiscal and monetary policy as well. And it's also a f function of mortgage systems and land value controls. You just talked about affordable housing. Now, looking at the civil servant, realistically, mm. I mean, given their pay grades and all mm. of that, is it within the reach oh, yeah. of the civil servant? Uh, uh, we built for them. And I can tell you confidently that uh, many civil and public servants are beneficiaries of some of the things we have built. If you look at the uh, last one that we did at Zuba, President handed keys to people. All of them were public servants. Were they subsidized in any way? No, we don't subsidize housing yet. Maybe Nigeria will get there someday. America subsidizes rent, or we do. So, but you know that there's this National Housing Fund managed by the Federal Mortgage Bank. So through that platform, they can get mortgage loans. They can get rent support loans. So that is a platform that helps some of them to pay. We've also initiated what we call a rent-to-own policy for those who cannot afford to buy at once. So we have catered to three spectrum, uh, three people, three, three bands of people in a spectrum. That's as affordable as I think we can be for now. That doesn't mean the door is closed to doing other things. One of the things I would like to see done going forward is how government consciously uh, deploys fiscal policy and monetary policy to converge around the housing. I want to see some of the initiatives that have gone into sectors like agri for example, go into housing. But look, we are cooking a large pot of stew. So let's solve one problem at a time. At a time. So now we look at the housing deficit and we look at um, Abuja, for instance. There are so many houses that are un unoccupied. And I've heard you talk about it. That if you had your way, you would 
evenly distribute it in such a way that uh, those houses are not lying fallow. Were you able to address it at any point in your tenure? Well, we, we tried. Well, you see, again, you have to be clear in your diagnosis of what is causing a problem. Otherwise, you apply the wrong tools mm -hmm. and the wrong remedies. Houses that you say and that I know are empty, um, the question I've asked is why are they empty? Some of the feedback is that people are asking for three years rent or they're asking for cash payment to buy. So, and don't, I don't see housing as ownership alone. It's a combination of ownership and rental. So, and I'm wondering, okay, how can we unlock all of these things from three years maybe to six months? So I had a meeting with the Institute of Estate Surveyors and I said, Go and look at all of these things and look at houses that have been unoccupied for, let's say, I think we, we, the threshold was about six or so months. And let's find out what really is the problem. How can we get there? Um, I think there was an inception report, but the work was never really concluded, I must admit. But it is work that needs to be done. But some of the feedback we got was also some of those houses were not built for the uh the demography that has uh that has the real demand that's the demography of my children 30 and below so you go and build one large house and suite bathroom they don't want it anymore that's not their thing they're living in small spaces they want small apartments because that's how they grew up they want Wi-Fi, they want their backpack, they want a gym. So if you are building a massive kitchen, they eat out now. So they won't rent that house and they won't buy it. Let's uh, leave housing now, go into roads. There's this road, this is a Papa Road. It's been <laughs> a perennial Which challenge. Which are Papa? Yeah, pa the whole of that are Papa Corridor. Okay. You know, traffic, managing traffic, going in and out of a Papa has always been a challenge. I remember even the vice president intervene and okay, made some okay, statements okay, okay, that uh, okay, 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 okay. today are still okay, statements okay, which have not okay. really you know taken to fruition so the question therefore is i mean given your expertise mm. how do we really 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 address that corridor when it comes to road network traffic and given the fact that it's a business hub and is also contributing to national grid okay so um Let's go back to first principles. What's the problem? If you don't understand what's causing the problem, you can't solve it. Sure. Um, when that log jam started, the log jam in Apapa, I spent some time, because of my knowledge of the place also, and I spent some time interacting with the operators. And they told me, that look, that it's the port system and all of that. Of course, there were issues. The road was bad. But they kept saying, and I have videos of a meeting I had with all the people using the port, clearing, shipping, forwarding, agents, everybody, truckers. And I have those videos. And they said, yes, we know the road is bad. But minister, if you finish this road and you don't solve the other problems, Nothing is going to happen. So, my takeaway then was the road was a contributory factor, not a causative factor. So let's get that clear. So, what's causing the problem? We have outgrown that pot. Let's just be honest with ourselves. So, other countries are planning port expansions for 2050, 2060. And a port that we built in 1974, 75, 76, over 45 years ago, is still supporting our economy that has grown in multiples of its size when we built it. So it's like wearing the dress you wore as a teenager now. It's going to be uncomfortable if you manage to get inside it. 
That's what's happening. So let's not point road or whatever. We need port expansion quickly. Luckily, the lucky seaport is now on stream. I'm proud again that I had a role to play in that project. Dredging also needs to be done to make some other ports attractive. And if you ask me, as I've recommended, there must also be discriminatory pricing because not all of the cargo that is coming through the Lagos port ends in Lagos. Okay. At least uh, you have uh, given us insight to that uh, road network because it's always been a challenge. I just thought that no, we finished our with a spread the of you know seaports across the corridors, and I mean, the where there are opportunities, well, we should there's explore a road that them. Last long, but there is a problem already emerging on that road, so I must put it out there in the public. People are trading on the road, so the road is not a marketplace. So governments at federal and state level must must work together to remove all of those. Those are also issues of corruption and all of that. I mean, people break the law and start turning into a road to a market. There must be no room for that in any civilized society. They need to be. Okay, so we rewind back to when you were the governor because it's conversation with history. And um, we ask as many questions as time would permit. And this question will be on your stewardship while you were the governor, two-time governor. I remember the first one, Super governor. And at some time when you were coming in at a, at a second term, there were some hiccups, but uh, the people spoke. And um, for some reason, you know, everything was uh, resolved. And, uh... So are you saying I wasn't super again <laughs> in the second term? <laughs> <laughs> no, you were. You were. You were super. As a matter of fact, it was this, your super stardom that uh, projected you to the national level where they said, oh, he can do it, he can do it. And uh, for some reason, you know, we now know the reasons why things went the way they, they went. Of course, we have it on record now. But in the course of your governorship, there was something that stood out, and I'm saying it against the backdrop of what is happening now. And that was that um, identity, resident identity card. What exactly did you have in mind? What was the big picture? Okay, so <clears throat> population of Lagos was growing at an alarming rate. Every success of Lagos was creating bigger challenges. And that's why you will see in the last elections when people were fixated, Lagos was generating 51 billion, da 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 da. And I said, okay, you see only the income, you don't see the responsibility. <clears throat> so, I, I never had cause to live abroad, so I don't know how this works. But I do know that everybody who goes to major cities abroad is either trying to get a driver's license or a national number or whatever. Because if you don't get an identity in those other cities or countries in the West, you are locked out of the financial system. You can't pay rent, you can't buy stuff, you can't open an account, you can't do anything. And I thought, okay, fine. If people are coming into Lagos, they're welcome. But well, you can't be anonymous. So you must have a residence card. If you have a residence card, I know you are in town. I have your number. I have an idea of your location. So when we are planning water, we are planning refuse management, we are planning hospital beds, we are planning school classrooms, we can predict what demography you come into. And so when we are also levying tax, we can find you to contribute your quota. If it's going to be a commonwealth, it must be built by common contribution. So that was really the underpinning of, of the residence identity. We want you to identify yourself. And of course, it will go to issues of crime detection, crime management. It will go to so many other things. But you can't live in a community and be anonymous. And then to be a, a what do you, what's the word now? So you just take a free ride on everybody's back mm. without contributing anything. So that was that was really it. So how would you react to those who thought that, okay, there was some tribal ethnic undertone to it? Obviously, those were <laughs> very uh, off-the-target misconceptions because everybody uh, who lived and wanted to register, was afforded an opportunity to register. That's what it's all about. 
You see, <clears throat> I've said before and I will say again, um, Lagos shares some things with global capitals of the world like uh, New York, London, uh, Montreal, uh, and all of those uh, type of cities because they've tried on immigrant capital. So uh, if you don't value immigrant capital, you can't be illegals. It's a cultural melting point. Come and be all you can. There's an opportunity for you to do that. So did you succeed with the mandate, <coughs> the objective, the primary objective? Oh, yeah, we made progress. We couldn't conclude the exercise. You know, there are so many things sometimes that you can't complete, even if you are the visioner, uh, uh, and you have to pass it on. You were two-time governor of Lagos State, and of course, recent happenings, especially this political, this electoral cycle that just happened. So many things happened. So many things were brought to bear. And the question is, what's your perception of how Lagos literally turned into a tribal, some kind of tribal war almost happened in Lagos? And the question is, <coughs> you were there at some point, and at your time, it, it wasn't an issue. Sure. But... It became an issue in the last electoral cycle. There were tensions in some parts of Lagos. So in the place where I vote and lived in Suruleri, anybody who is not afraid to confront the facts knows how mixed that place is in Suruleri. So we did have tensions there. We voted. Everybody had a choice. So. In some places, there were flashpoints of extreme uh, uh, language and extreme understanding. And so, again, we must continue to educate people that an election is not a war. And if you don't do that education, very extreme and sometimes unfortunate incidents will take place. Elections for me are a contest of ideas, a festival to enjoy. And that was the way I campaigned as governor. So, um, and people also, uh, and, and, and I'm happy to see that people are showing interest in the politics is good. But it doesn't end there. The political training must now start from primary school. The education must start from there, that this is not war. It's a contest of ideas. It's a contest of choices. It has nothing absolutely to do with where you were born, who you were born to. And, you know, I was telling one young person yesterday that clearly many of you know more about the American dream because it has been valorized and celebrated. But the Nigerian bring, dream is bigger than the American dream if you stand back and watch it. If you see which, which head of the royal family has ever ruled Nigeria in all the presidents, which son of a king has ever ruled Nigeria? People from very humble backgrounds have risen from nothing to everything and gone onto the global stage. But we don't see that, do we? We don't even own it. So this is a place where people are coming from different continents, different countries, uh, in a manner of decades from hard work. They don't want to go again. This is where the global dream lies, depending on what you want to see. And as I tell people, I like to see angels, not devils. But let me tell you one thing. I don't know how much you know of the story of Lagos and how deep it goes. This has been long in the making. Let's leave it at that. It has been long in the making. It just came to the surface now. And so there's a lot of education, moderation of language. Language is the key. Words spoken. And then positions are taken. So, you've been in government long enough. I mean, long enough. Too to long. Have Too an long. opinion on restructuring. On restructuring. Restructuring. Yes. <laughs> so let's let's talk about that. Ah. <laughs> What's your idea? Ah.
What's your idea of restructuring? Do you I have an opinion on many things. Good. So, you know, I've listened to the arguments extensively and uh, I wrote a speech about it actually and I think you should read the speech and maybe it would help and maybe Akim, I wrote a speech about it that I delivered on behalf of the president at the Island Club. So there are those who want political restructuring mm. and there are those who want constitutional restrictions. So let's, let's, my sense, my sense first of all, is that as far as it relates to the constitution, the public is being fed a wrong message in thinking that that power lies with the president. No. The power to make any constitutional amendment in aid of restructuring actually lies with us. We have elected senators, we have elected House of Reps members, they are representing us. If that issue is a serious enough issue, let our representatives pass the law to amend the constitution. Let us have two-thirds of the state houses of assembly adopt it. And let us make those issues, issues that will determine whether a senator or a house of rep member or a house of assembly gets our votes for the next time. How can, for example, a bill that goes to parliament to amend the provisions relating to citizenship, so that women can confer citizens on foreign husbands, not pass. The women didn't make it an issue, I'm sorry. I know they tried. Now, my broad principles, those who want restructuring, some of them say, oh, let's go back to parliamentary system. So when young people ask me, because I was a child when we last had the parliament, I said, well, if that was so good for us, why did it? Collapse. Why did it collapse, create violence, result in conflict, and ended in a civil war? But perhaps they are reaching to what they are comfortable with. Mm. And they don't like this presidential system. As a teenager, this was the first political system I operated with, the presidential system. I love it, in spite of its challenges. So, really, are we going to have debate around that? And then people say, restructuring and with the political one i ask what do you want to change in the constitution that has not been written before is it the part that proclaims with the people people have lied about that and said the constitution was written by the military and handed over to us it's a lie well i read the doctor's nikitobi report they set up a constitution drafting panel headed by justice nikitobi they called for memoranda from around the world. People contributed overseas here. And they all said, give us back the 1979 constitution. That's what people asked for. With some modifications. I have read that report. So people should stop all of these sound bites. The constitution was dictated by me. It's a lie. One of those who would also counter you by saying that the cost of governance is too expensive. So by way of restructuring, perhaps uh, we may be able to have some level of cost containment. Oh, yes, case. I agree with that. I agree with that. Cost of government, in my view, if that is restructuring, itemize it as an issue. So let's go through it. So one of the things this administration is doing, for example, is that we are completing some of the federal secretariats that we met and building new ones. Because also, it's interesting, this point has come up. So part of restructuring, creating more states, is also part of restructuring. From the last state's creation exercise, we haven't solved all the problems that they created. So even that restructuring too has long-term consequences. So those states created at that time, I, th I don't remember when the last one, we still have boundary issues unresolved. Between Nasarawa, uh, Niger, uh, Kaduna, and all over the country, because I'm a member of the Boundary Commission, chaired by the Vice President. So there are long-term issues. So let everybody come and say, this is what I want. My Put position up. has always been that there is no perfect constitution, and that what the people of Nigeria want is a better life, not a better document. And that even what exists currently, have we optimized it? Has said, okay, people have wanted state police. I ask people, how many states can fund a police? 
We've seen some of the examples now with Ubiago and Moteku. How many are funding them? How many are managing them? Except a few. Well, the president-elect, what are those areas you think he would really, really, really make a difference, given your experience and your relationship with him, knowing his style of government and governance? Okay, so um, I've seen people saying, oh, setting an agenda for the president-elect. I say, ah, that's too late. The horse has bolted. They are trying to lock the stable after the horse has bolted. This man campaigned on a manifesto. The majority of Nigerians who elected him were persuaded by that manifesto. That's my view of how democracy works. So you can't set a new agenda. In terms of uh, uh, what would be different, well, two, the two different personality traits here, yeah, as I've said before. Uh, Buhari delegates, I show you micromanage. So that would be a change in style. And uh, um, Buhari works during the day, Ashaju works more at night. That would be a change in style. Um, what else? <clears throat> um, interestingly, we are, we are likely going to see now a legislative heavy executive. And by that I mean we have two senators, two former governors, as number one and number two. We have a party chairman, also senator. So you will see, perhaps, uh, the blend of legislative experience and previous executive experience combined in one. Buhari was never in parliament. So those are differences that you hope will help to build consensus. Because democracy is about building consensus. If you're called upon to be part of this government actively, like you have been in this uh, administration, would you accept it? I will, I will serve my country as hard as I can. Can you tell us on this program, let it be an exclusive, something they didn't know about Babatude Raji Fashola? I didn't like school. <laughs> <laughs> How come you're this brilliant? No, I'm not brilliant. Oh, so what are you? I'm not brilliant. I didn't like school, and uh, I tell I tell young people now that uh, um, you know, listen to your parents. I'm here because my parents didn't give up on me. I was a very very difficult child, but I tell parents also slow it down. The child will mature, and uh, I think that uh, perhaps the People like the more mature side of me. I was very playful. Didn't want to do any work. Didn't want to study. Just went to class when I liked. And But here we are. It's, it's been a long journey. I'm thankful to my parents, my family. So I, I play very hard. So, you work hard and play hard. Yes. So uh, I'm at the two extremes. And I've learned now to, balance. to perhaps balance them. So when I'm busy having fun, heaven can wait. Yeah. But did you ever see yourself getting to this point? No, 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 no. I was the most unlikely person in public service. Uh, my first interaction with the public service was when I was posted to the Ministry of Justice in Edo State as a youth copper. I blatantly refused to work in government. I didn't like government. And uh, my second experience after youth call, my father got me a job in uh, Naipus. I said, no, I'm not working in government. Then when was the last time and I said, no, I want to practice law and I want to be in a private sector law firm, not in government. So, but in 2002, Ashwa just sent for me and said, look, you can't go and be in private practice. Everybody is sacrificing something here, so come and sacrifice with me. So, and that's how I entered government. And I realized that uh, it was such a noble obligation to be a public servant and to be able to impact people on a scale that nothing in private sector can prepare you for. Would you have done things differently? Is there anything you would have done differently? I will start in the public service. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> the same public service that you... <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, getting to know it now, you know, one of the things, you know, uh, how do I say this? My best days in government 
are when people walk away from my office with a smile. Those are my best days. A problem solved. So that's what being a public officer means to me. So uh, when I hear that people now travel uh, fewer kilometers on a road than five years ago, those are my best days. That's the reason why I have public office, to make it better, to make it easier. And so on that note, I want to say thank you so much. Thank you. For being part of thank you for having me. Thank you. It's been an insightful conversation. And we hope that uh, maybe when you, start, uh, when you start having your grandchildren, we'll have another conversation. Hopefully. Perhaps your thank views you. will have changed then. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And so on that note, I want to say thank you so much for being part of a conversation with history. Until next time when we come your way, I'm Fekla Wilkie and stay safe.